All right, here's the layout of what we're going to do today. We're going to break this into three sections with two breaks, but consider this to be a three hour crash course in poetry. Oh my God. Wow. Wow. So here's where we start. Best to start with an introduction to poetry. Okay, let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Gardner. How would you set up a three hour lecture on poetry? <laughs> this is going to suck. <laughs> you pass out cyanide pills. <laughs> you will take this, probably within the first five minutes, but uh, so it goes. Speaking of cyanide, would you believe there's cyanide? Your body converts uh, cherry pits to cyanide. I don't know if you can that or not. Also, apple seeds. Okay. Speaking of cherry pits, I had the best cherry pie of my life two days ago. Where? Why are you pointing this at me? Best <laughs> cherry so you know pie. Of my are you? Unfortunately, but I still eat them. They're so good. I have heard so many people say they're allergic to things that they still eat. How is that possible? Oh, because you can't eat too many. Whereas That's, with no, nuts, okay. I can't you eat any. You said because you can't eat too many. What you're supposed to say is so I don't eat too many. The, true enough, but <laughs> how can you do it? Because. You don't need a lot. That's, that's right. And I love so, <laughs> Mr. Gardner, to respond to your query, I want to know. I think my start was better. Where, where did you find the cherry pie? Yeah, yeah. What, what was the story about? Like you introduced this, and now you just left me hanging when you were pointing. No, out. I don't care about the story. I, I just want to know that. where I can get the cherry pie. At least half of the people in here had the opportunity to have this cherry pie. Oh, oh no. come on! And it's actually more than that. One of them. More out of the seven. What? Uh, I don't know what happened. <laughs> what? Oh, that's zero. I. Oh my gosh! I don't remember. Oh, you're talking about me? Yes. Okay, because I was counting you three. Yeah. Okay. Plus you. Okay. 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 So over half of the people in here, and one person in here as a mother who's responsible for the creation of said pie. What? What? Jeremy? Throw down. No, it's it's probably Bruce Stringfellow, isn't it? Stringfellow. That was an awesome cherry pie. Can you bring us his pie? So, um, probably not, because the last I saw the pie was uh, Tom O'Brien, uh, <laughs> Michael and Allison had running away with it. <laughs> so <laughs> half the pie oh, left, that was the first and here he goes. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, no, slow motion, but he was going actual speed, so I knew I wasn't going to catch him, because I'm like, no, and he's actually running. It wasn't a good situation. Uh, pie was gone. Did you have hey, any pork left over? Did you your mom to make this pie for the yes. last Why is it not here? Because, well, the pork was actually yes. part of the picnic, I had to throw away because I was sitting out for two hours. But there's only enough for about two sandwiches. So, so you really needed that much meat. That's surprising. Well, actually, I didn't take all of it. I probably oh. have three pounds in the freezer. <laughs> so you definitely could have brought some. Oh, I did. It had been more than feasible. Probably would have been easier than reading the cherry pie, mm -hmm. which was taken away by Tom O'Brien. In full motion. No, he was in. Oh, he was in full motion. Yeah, that's right. Motion. That's right. Good. Now we're going to the final exam. Yes. Final exam question number one. Who made the cherry pie? Who took the cherry pie away? And what speed was I chasing that cherry pie? Is this all question one or is this one through three? All this question is going to be a an essay response. Uh, <laughs> which will be composed of thesis, your thoughts on the cherry, and, in all seriousness, what that cherry represents. The connotations of that. Things I can't have. Vast and endless. And personal connotations versus generally accepted connotations. You know, things you know, I can't have, but things you can't have as well. Exactly. Because well, and then you think about it in the larger picture of dessert, what dessert represents, what how it plays an essential part both in, in a meal, but also in life. Oh, yeah. The sweeter things, the elusive things, much like Gatsby's green light. Mm -hmm. There's that cherry pie. There's Tom. Tom mm -hmm. Buchanan. Ah. Oh. With his cherry oh. some of this, and then there's Gatsby, <laughs> slow motion, and then <laughs> What happened? He got shot. I made it like, a headshot because that's so much cooler. His like, whole back of his head exploded? Yeah. 
because he's going for the cherry pie. Have you ever seen a gunshot victim? And then he gets shot. It doesn't just go in and out. Yeah. Ping! Oh! Yeah. <laughs> it's far more dramatic. If you get hit in the head, it creates a vacuum in your head and then your head explodes. Speaking of what we just did, what use of figurative language was that? That was a metaphor. Uh, Unless you were using words. Allegory. No. It was I don't know, sarcasm. you were saying the okay, pie that. is like... <laughs> often, uh, often what is sarcasm is um, incorrectly labeled, labeled as, or as uh, sarcasm. It's actually verbal Yeah, that's right. I was referring to leaving it a reference to Gatsby. Illusion. Illusion. Specifically what type of illusion? Literary. Now, throughout the course of today's class, we are going to write every single use of figurative language that appears in any of these poems on this board. And my hope is that by the end, we'll have a decent list of aspects of figurative language that you will have at your fingertips. And the first one is illusion. This one was featured prominently on your quiz because of its three primary types. Now, in its just basic definition, Sam, what is an illusion? Not to be confused with illusion, which is like dinosaur. Oh, okay. Um, you can't fool us. <laughs> I tried. I bet I can fool Alec if I put some actual oh. art in there. Clip <laughs> art of a dinosaur. <laughs> Green screen in the background. Just, you know, I mean, eaten by a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Right? You'd be on. like, whoa! Illusion. Just <laughs> intercut footage crazy. of Jurassic Park. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, illusion is a reference, very simply, a reference. It's a little bit more than that, but there are several categories, and I'm going to erase the categories once we get them up here, but the first and probably most significant illusion is the literary illusion, and more often than not, the literary illusion is alluding to what author? Shakespeare. Shakespeare. It's always Shakespeare. If you consider this to be English literature, Shakespeare is at the center. Which, which, on some level, doesn't make sense given the span, right? We start in 500 AD, we go up until now, 2000, what are we, 15? Shakespeare comes along 450 years ago, not even at the halfway point. But his significance, all encompassing. Most literary allusions are allusions to Shakespeare, like William Faulkner's book, The Sound and the Fury like the Robert Frost poem that you probably didn't get a chance to read because it was in, it was woven into one of the chapters, Out, Out. That is an illusion. Out, Out, Read Candle. Literary illusion. The second most significant is what? Historical. Actually not historical. Historical kind of falls into the fourth. Four. What is it? Biblical. The biblical illusion. And biblical illusions, which are always allusions to biblical stories or, or very famous Bible verses, they <laughs> always use what version of the Bible? Uh, King James. The King James Version. So anytime you see these really kind of lofty, um, <clears throat> in my mind, brother's keeper, very famous illusion, and was made into a book several times over, is a reference to, um, to the Bible, specifically the King James Version. The third most important type of illusion? I really, I really love your work. Your poem, Marginalia, 
just really changed the way I look at poetry. Just really changed it. And he said, in a good way or in a bad way? <laughs> and I said, oh, sir, no, no, sir, in, in a good way. I mean, oh, In the worst way possible. <laughs> <laughs> I no longer read poetry. And I'm holding my little digital camera, and I said, Mr. Collins, can I get a picture with you? There's this long line of people behind me, and they're all just like, oh. and he's like, I, I, I suppose. And I said, would you mind if we stand up for this picture? <laughs> he's like, so he stands up, and there's me, and I'm like, and he's like, and there's a picture, Billy Collins and myself. So he did so, not reciprocate with you. This, he did not. He did not. Uh, this is this is one of my favorite poems of his, and it's one of my favorites because it captures what is going on in your mind right now. Okay, but, so before you look at this, I want you to think about what's going on in your mind. When I say, not just that we're going to be looking at poetry, but we're spending three hours on poetry. I love that. Your thought is probably not the most ecstatic. You're thinking, let's watch some more of uh, Hamlet theatrically jumping off of the balcony while throwing a sword <laughs> and dumping poisoned wine into his Great. uncle's mouth. You know, because that's that's what we want to see. What year was that movie made? Ninety-four, somewhere around there, ninety-five. Okay. I guess they might have more of a right to have that sword fly the way that it did. <laughs> yeah. Kenneth Branagh is known for his theatricality with movies and occasionally wanting to throw rainbows in, in the air. But I don't know what for. In Emmy? How would he have won an Emmy? I don't know. What miniseries was he in? Not what did he win an Emmy for, but how. That's the real question. Yes, yes. I'll try and find he's quite He's quite talented and, uh, and, and played a great Hamlet. But you know, he also directed that movie, by the way. He also directed Thor, though. Yes. So, Which is known for being you know, the first one being reasonable. Uh, I disagree. Reasonable. I don't think so. Everyone I hated it. Yeah. Marvel I'm, sucks. I'm kind of Thor. Don't know if you knew that or not. How are you Whoops. three people? Wasn't supposed <laughs> to mention that. Sorry. Asgard, one of you called Wyatt, whatnot. You're not are covering you? it up very well, are you? I, I always knew. I was like, you've seen him eight Introduction to poetry. This is also, you could subtitle it as The Teacher's Problem. Because here it is. I. I ask them to take a poem and hold it up to the light like a color slide, or press an ear against its hive. I say, drop a mouse into a poem and watch him probe his way out, or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. How is this the teacher's plight? The teacher's problem? I'll tell you what's not helping is assigning us poems to read. Okay, so there's an irony there. Yeah. What is the student's quest when given a poem? Find the meaning. Find Here's a poem, and then the student sees one of those magic eye puzzles where you move it a little bit and you see, you know, a, a rabbit or something. You see, you're given this poem, and you're told, "I want you to find the meaning of this poem." But we have all but erased poetry from our curriculum simply because most people don't like it. And as a result, when you encounter it your senior year, you're predisposed against it, thinking, "I don't like this." Because I don't understand this, because I'm not supposed to understand this, because it's unnecessarily complicated, which is precisely the problem. And so you have this, you know, enthusiastic kind of poetry teacher who says, "Here's this great poem that I love," and you read it and you say, "Okay, let me figure out what this means so I can analyze it." So on one level, there's this there's this paradox where the teacher wants you to enjoy the poem, to water ski on the poem, to have fun with the poem. But the teacher also wants you to analyze and get the poem. So we're caught between these two extremes. How to do poetry. Which end do you fall into? If you had to pick one, I really do think the analysis one is something that is attainable, very attainable for all of you. So that's the angle we're going to take. 
But by the time we're done today, if you come across a column that you actually like, gasp, and can tolerate double gasp, great. And I'd love to hear it. However, it is also sometimes a social suicide to say that you like the column. So be careful about that. Unless it's Ozymandias, because apparently it's cool if Walter White says it. In a I also, books. I really like uh, The World is Too Much For This. Legitimately like it? Yeah, I really did. I mean, it took me a while. It took me a while, but once I really understood what he was saying, I really liked that poem. And this is one of the things about poetry. Yeah, you know, sometimes it's required to read once or twice to really kind of get. So this is the example I want you to see on how this works. Next Tuesday, we are reading Jane Eyre. Which, by the way, we're only focusing on the first half. Yay! Of Jane Eyre is a massive novel. It's some, some version is 350, some version is 450 pages. It is a big old novel versus Gatsby, which is pretty much a novella. It's a good book. I like Gatsby. But Gatsby is one-fourth the length of Moby Dick. And Moby Dick is the great American novel. I know you didn't like it. So be it. It is the great American novel. I can understand that, at least. It's a pretty good song. Jane Eyre is essentially the British novel. And by that I mean it is lengthy, it is full of characters, it has a huge plot, lots of symbolism, plenty of themes, it is the big novel. Now, I want you to picture the big Jane Eyre novel put into a compressor that pushes it this way, and pushes it this way, and pushes, 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 until, like we said earlier, it is the reverse of that that uh, little sponge animal in the capsule. Have you ever tried to put one of those back into a capsule? It's, it's so very hard. difficult. Because once that thing opens up, it's very difficult to, get that, to go back in. If we took Jane Eyre, ignore the great event sign, and we condense, condense, condense to make it like this, you basically are taking the vast world of themes, the vast world of characters, the vast world of literature, and you're Okay. Think of it like this. What if you could take an eight-course meal and take all the nutrition, take all the calories, take every component of it, the flavor, everything, and just condense it to one bite? So it's like, like, yeah. what, what is this? So it's like a so. nutritional drink that's supposed to give you all your nutrients and have like no flavor in Some it? Some people live on only this. I think it's... it's What's it called? Soylent? Soylent. Soylent. After Soylent Green? Yeah. It's not made of people. It's terrifying. <laughs> it's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> the end has come, people. The apocalypse is not. Um, basically, my father was right. You need to buy a shotgun and hoard canned foods, people. Um, because, my gosh, the zombies are on their way. Your dad said this. Uh, yeah. This was... <laughs> This was in justification for the shotgun he had just purchased. Um, this explains so it has, much value. It has like these um, camouflage skulls on the side of it. When and, did, uh, wait, when did this? And my happen? dad is very much. He looks like me. Did this happen when you were thirty years older? Or, okay, so picture me, thirty years older. That's my dad. You He's not older than you. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Nice. <laughs> 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 Not and he, he's not like a car mechanic kind of big, you know. Kind of, he's like he's like a guy who sits at a computer, kind of, you know, kind of person. And when he holds the shotgun, there's this sharp contrast behind <laughs> the sort of you know backwoods hick you would expect to be holding the shotgun, and then this you know this this man who's holding it. But but his comment, he's been watching The Walking Dead. <laughs> Based on my recommendation. He's been watching The Walking Dead and felt the need to buy a shotgun. You did this. <laughs> or some canned food. Because one never knows. I think we do. A now. zombie could it Bednar. Bednar could be in the process right now. That's why he's not of here. turning into a zombie. Oh my he's God. becoming out of the five. Body, <laughs> frothing at the mouth. He's either going to be one of those zombies from um, Dawn of the Dead, which are like. Or 28 days later zombies, which are like, ooh. Okay. If he's that kind of zombie, uh, you need to know what's going to happen. Probably. 
which is, I dive behind this and pull it against the wall while he devours all of you, and then I sneak out of the room as you're turning into zombies, I lock the door, it doesn't lock from this side, right? Uh, I very quickly go outside, and, uh, and, and my, my dad is six minutes away. I head to his house with the canned goods and the shotgun. He's six minutes away? For some yeah. reason I imagine him living. Oh, yeah, I see him like in Kentucky or something. Yeah. You know, see, that's the thing, like, like the, the Kentucky image, that's not him. But yet he has the Kentucky image shotgun. I, I picture your dad a lot, actually. As a what? Hmm? A lot. A lot. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> in Futurama, they have a drink called Soylent Cola, and one character asks, how is it? The other character says, it varies from person to person. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's <Okay>. good. <laughs> Thus, our problem. We have to talk about poetry, and no one really wants to do that, because on some level, it's there is a lack like of enjoyment about it. But, if you look at this poem, this introduction to poetry, this captures the essence of it. You have someone that you need to get information out of. So you begin torturing that person. And under pains of torture, that person gives you information. How do you know if that information is reliable or not? Testing it. You can test it out. Yeah. Otherwise, how do you know? You don't. You don't. You take any work of literature, you take Jane Eyre, you take a poem, you take a condensed form of this literature, and you say, what do you mean? What is your meaning? What is the main idea here? And you force it, it's going to feel forced. And trust me, after nine years of teaching, I've seen a lot of forced analyses of main ideas. You know, someone looks at a work of literature, they say, what's the main idea? Um, love and um, brotherhood for Christ, reunited, redemption, and let's uh, injustice. And you're like, what? what are you talking about? You've just thrown out every main idea that someone might include in the book. I know. I know I did. Um, aren't you proud? No. No. Or someone might say, No, I hate What's that dripping noise? Is that water imagery? Anyway. Um, oh my god. What you find in a lot of these poems oh my god. is because poems are often things that we're meant to experience. And literature as a whole is something we are meant to experience. Often these poems are filled with imagery. Okay, in a nutshell, who can tell me what imagery is? Imagery, any idea? So, senior year of English. This is your last year before college. You have to give me a definition of imagery. Vince, what's it gonna be? Without looking, just tell me uh, what's imagery. Representation of language through sense experience. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, what do you, you mean? You know, the, the, the photographic memory you have is, uh, is astounding. And you're absolutely right. Okay, consider this for just a moment. You're given a history textbook. And you're told this guy named Abraham Lincoln lived quite some time ago. He was very you know, influential in the Civil War. He gave a couple of very profound speeches. He was influential in the Emancipation Proclamation, and he was assassinated. And you say, okay, I get it. I know about Abraham Lincoln. But you have not met Abraham Lincoln. You have not seen the actual Abraham Lincoln. You have not met anyone who has met the actual Abraham Lincoln. You have no definite proof that Abraham Lincoln ever existed, except for the fact that someone told you that he did. As a result, you have no definitive proof, because you have not experienced it. And knowledge, as we know, comes to us largely through the senses. We know that that stove, when it is on, is hot. How do we know? Because probably at some point we have touched it. And our body has alerted us to the fact that that is heat. Because our sense of touch has said, ow. The sense of touch is what we call tactile. If I'm going to describe something to you, like the spongy moss on the bottom of a tree, and I talk about its soft, velvety, velvet texture, and the way it almost feels like a carpet under my fingers, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Because even if you've never touched that moss, you have definitively been in someone's basement who had spongy, nice carpet 
that you touched with your fingers and thought, this is quite nice. Tactile imagery. Or if I say, I want you to picture the cupcake that I had the other day. I want you to visualize that cupcake. This cupcake, first of all, was made of red velvet. The icing was cream cheese. It was swirled on the top. There were chocolate sprinkles littering the cream cheese. Its wrapping was in gold foil, which sparkled when the sunlight hit it. The more description I give you, the more you will be able to see it. You'll be able to visually see it. Now, there are five senses. Here are two of them. What's another sense? Not a trick question, people. Oh, uh, organic. Okay, what's another actual sense? One of your senses. Olfactory. Okay, okay. I don't want the fancy name, I want the actual one. What is olfactory? Um, your sense of smell. Smell. So we'll write olfactory because that's what it's called when you're analyzing poetry. But a sense of smell. Sam, I want you to describe the smell of something. Pick anything. Smell anything. Smell okay. um, You know how you walk outside, and sometimes it depends on what shirt you're wearing, but you walk back inside, even after just a little bit, and there's just this smell. It's like this, you know, you know the person's been outside, and it's this astringent odor that, that just kind of hits you, almost, almost like the smell of a handful of pennies. Like if you rub pennies in your hand, and then smell your hand, it's that sort of odor that just is stuck in your shirt. And um, it's, it's, it's infuriating. So you take a group of 12 or 15 people who have just been outside and put them all in the same room, and there's just going to be this palpable odor to the room. Olfactory imagery. Um, the old sweaty gym bag kind of smell. What's another sense? We have the touch, see, smell, and... Gustatory. Taste. Thank you. Taste, which is gustatory. Which you're trying to be all fancy. Gust, right? Eat. Um, the sense of taste. In the field of cooking, the sense of taste is one of the most important ones. In fact, there are three up here that are highly significant with cooking. First, you eat with your eyes. So the visual presentation of the food is significant. So anytime you learn about food, they talk about presentation on the plate, how it has to look beautiful. Then there's the smell, the olfactory. How does the food smell? Does it waft into your nose? Then there is the taste. When you taste it, does it hit all of the aspects of your tongue? Does it make you think of memories from the past? Like the scene in Ratatouille, oh. where the food critic ate the Ratatouille and was taken back to a time when he was a child and his mother had prepared a similar dish and it brought back that memory and a smile and a warm feeling. That is the power of taste, of gustatory. And if your words can make someone taste something, you have evoked a sense experience. And when you evoke a sense experience, you evoke possibly pleasure, pain, memory, feeling. And those are powerful things indeed from a mere arrangement of letters. This is huge. What's our other sense? Auditory. Hearing. Auditory. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Edgar Allan Poe poem, Bells. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to turn this off.